Thank you for all of your hard work. What's that? Oh, she's doing good. She's doing pretty good. Thank okay. you. Okay. Very good news. Good. Can I ask folks to take their seats, please? Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, special on-bank hearing on the digital television transition, which also serves as our February uh, FCC open meeting. Uh, first, just on a point of personal privilege, a word of thanks to the uh, many people, both inside the commission and outside, who have eased my own personal transition to acting chairman. Uh, I realize more than ever before the high caliber of public servants who work here at the FCC and their enthusiasm in helping me get launched on this uh, exciting, if time-limited, uh, experience is deeply appreciated. Uh, my two colleagues and friends, Commissioners Adelstein and McDowell, have gone uh, very far out of their way to uh, help and to expedite our work in the last two weeks, and I'm deeply grateful to both of them. And my many thanks to the individuals and organizations outside the FCC who have not only shared their good wishes, but offered their help and cooperation. Uh, with that, it's a pleasure to welcome you all here to discuss our nation's transition to digital television. The good news is that Congress has now given us some extra time to help consumers prepare for this important switchover. I welcome this delay because it has long been clear to me, and it has become even more clear in the less than two weeks that I have been acting chairman, that we are not ready for a nationwide transition on February 17th. Now some say we won't be ready on June 12th either, and that there will be still consumers left behind. It's true that this transition will not be seamless but it will dislocate a lot fewer people in June than it would have in 12 days and 10 hours from now. With the additional time, with adequate additional resources for this and other affected agencies to do their jobs, and with a committed and coordinated public-private partnership, the kind of effort we are starting to put into place, and you'll hear more about today, I believe we can make a real difference. We can improve consumer outreach and support, especially for our vo most vulnerable citizens. We can have a more effective and integrated call center program. We can get a better grip on coverage and reception issues that so many consumers are struggling with, serious problems that were for too long minimized or wished away. And we can certainly improve the converter box coupon program, which at last count had over 2 million U.S. households on a waiting list. It's too early today to present a grand new plan for the next four months. The ink on the legislation is not even dry. But I thought it was important to hold this meeting, to take stock of where we are, to describe what has been happening here at the Commission over the past two weeks, to discuss the public and private resources that will need to be brought to bear, and to wrestle with some of the tough issues that we face in creating a new and more effective game plan. While we don't have all the answers, we can work through what we know, ask the tough questions, and realize that even though it's a work in progress, it's important to be as open and as transparent as possible. I think we have brought better focus and more coordination to some of the challenges we face in the past couple of weeks, although we are not anywhere close to where we need to be. Hopefully, with the right coordination and adequate resources, we can get there soon. We will have more meetings like this, but we also need many more action meetings to bring all interested parties together on a frequent, a much more frequent basis. Those dialogues need to be regular, they need to be inclusive, they need to be coordinated, and they need to be directed. And I believe we're on the road to making that happen. One of the first things we need to get our arms around <coughs> is what is going to happen on February 17th. Congress passed the DTV delay bill primarily to give consumers additional time to prepare for the end of analog service. We must keep this consumer focus front and center as we proceed. At the same time, Congress directed the FCC to give stations flexibility about turning off their analog signals in advance of June 12th. Broadcasters have been planning for the end of analog service on February 17th, and some would face real hardship if they had to reverse course. The law passed yesterday states very explicitly that nothing in the act 
is intended to prevent a licensee from moving early to digital so long as all early switchovers are conducted in accordance with current FCC requirements. Clearly then, we have a balance to strike. On the one hand, the fundamental premise of the new law is that many consumers are not ready, that coupons are unavailable to them, and that they haven't been adequately informed about how to prepare, why they are having difficulty getting reception, and where they can turn for help. On the other hand, we must proceed cognizant of the requirement to retain sufficient flexibility to recognize the unique circumstances of individual stations in markets across the country. Today we have released a public notice provide a to provide a framework for striking this balance. You will hear more about it on panel three this afternoon, but generally it requires stations that wish to turn off their analog signals on February 17th to notify the FCC by next Monday, February 9th, of their intent to do so. And we reserve the right to deny those requests if we find that they would not serve the public interest or would frustrate Congress's goal of giving consumers adequate time to prepare. For instance, if all or most stations in the market are planning to terminate analog service on February 17th, that would merit our close scrutiny. And we may require the stations to file additional information to demonstrate whether they really have a compelling case. After February 17th, we revert to the standards set forth in our rules for the termination of analog signals. I am happy to report that some broadcasters have already stepped up to the plate and expressed their commitments to staying on the air until June 12th. These broadcasters are truly serving the public interest by giving real world meaning to what Congress did yesterday. And I agree wholeheartedly with what Senator Rockefeller said yesterday, put consumers first. Thus far, the following broadcasters have committed to continuing to transmit an analog and digital on their owned and operated stations through June 12th. CBS, Fox, NBC and Telemundo, and ABC. In addition, Gannett and Hearst Argyle have said that the vast majority of their stations will maintain an analog signal until June 12th. These broadcasters deserve our gratitude. I encourage other broadcasters to join them. Never have we asked consumers to jump through so many hoops in order to pick up a broadcast signal or perhaps to receive any consumer product or service. And in a situation where many are unable adequate, adequately to prepare themselves, and also wherein many who have prepared themselves may still lose signals, we have the most solemn obligation to inform, to inform and assist them. There are many other changes that need to be made in coming days. PSAs, websites, literature, the list goes on and on. And that includes, that list includes commission rules too. Some of these rules consume consumer, concern consumer education requirements. We need to clarify how the old rules work with the new date. To take one example, right now most stations are required to run a countdown clock to remind consumers how many days are left until the transition. Now that the date has been changed, the countdown clock could be misleading. I've discussed this matter with my colleagues and our view right now is that only stations planning to transition on February 17th should be running a countdown clock to February 17th. All other stations should not carry a countdown clock until they are within 100 days of their transition dates. While we cannot officially change the rule yet, we would not expect the Commission to take action against any station that follows this course. So there's much to do, and that's why no one should use the delay as an excuse to take a break, but rather as an opportunity to redouble our efforts and work even more closely together. Everyone in this room needs to be part of the solution. Working together, we can make a huge difference for consumers. Everyone here and the organizations they represent worked hard and expended lots of energy and resources over the past many months. But you were also deprived, and it wasn't your fault, of the kind of government help and leadership that are required to mobilize the resources needed to surmount a challenge of this magnitude. <clears throat> I want to thank you again for all the work you've done, and I want to pay special respects and offer my deepest thanks to my FCC colleagues who are working. Many have volunteered 
to develop a transition that works. They are at work all around this place and in many places all around the country. And I've been with them in many cities and towns across America over the past year, and so have Commissioners Adelstein and McDowell and the extensive outreach that they have undertaken. All these folks have made the situation so much better than it otherwise would have been. And now that we can give them some additional time and hopefully more adequate resources, they are going to help consumers and citizens throughout the country cross over the bridge to DTV. Before I close, let's put all of these problems and hurdles aside for just 30 seconds and understand once again that once we have surmounted these obstacles, we will have brought not just broadcasters, but all Americans closer to full participation in the digital age. Better and more varied television? Sure but also Spectrum freed up so we can build, at long last, a public safety network worthy of its name. Spectrum freed up for more and better wireless services and for broadband so that we can put America at the head of the list of nations so far ahead that no one will even debate it in getting broadband out to all of our citizens. In the end, I do believe that that will make all of our current headaches and heartaches worth it. Uh, thank you, and now I'd ask my friend Commissioner Alistine if he would like to make a comment. Well, thank you, Chairman Copps. I, I had to say that because I like the sound of that so much. <laughs> uh, I'm glad that we are uh, using today's open meeting to focus on digital uh, television. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge this is the Chairman's first meeting since your ascension to the acting chairmanship, and certainly I'm looking forward to working with you on this and so many issues. Uh, nowhere is your leadership more apparent than in the way you've taken this digital television transition by the horns and really uh, shown such dedication and such alacrity in moving towards turning us around and getting us to do the kind of response that we need to do. I wanted to thank you for that. And of course, your staff has been working overtime. Uh, Rick and Scott and Gary, we appreciate what they've done in such a short period of time also and the heroic job of taking the helm under such challenging uh, circumstances in helping us chart a new and better course. Uh, so let me congratulate you on your first meeting here with the gavel and uh, thank you for helping to turn us around so quickly. And of course uh, the chairman gets all the attention but uh, underappreciated uh, development perhaps is my debut as acting interim senior commissioner. <laughs> Just wanted to note that for the record. Well, I'm, I, I'm certainly uh, glad that we we're, we're doing this forum today. I, I commend you, Mr. Chairman, for bringing us together to face these thorny issues in an open public forum. The kind of transparency we've all been talking about, the kind of openness we've all been talking about, we're still thinking through a lot of these issues, and I think this meeting will be reflective of the fact that we're still grappling together with how we're going to deal with this. But it's good that we do it in public. It's good that we do it together so that all the commissioners can hear from each other and from all the interested stakeholders in an open public way. Uh, while this commission has been responsible for the transition for some time, this is the first opportunity really that we as commissioners with other federal agencies, broadcasters, the cable industry, consumer electronics manufacturers and retailers, and uh, consumer groups and our engineers have had the opportunity to discuss these difficult uh, questions together. So I'm pleased we can roll up our sleeves and address this in such a transparent and collegial manner. Your leadership uh, is a real turnaround. It gives me hope that we can at last develop the coherent, planned, organized response that all three of us remaining commissioners have advocated for so long uh, thus far to no avail. I'd like to thank Commissioner McDowell also for his leadership and his frankness and openness and dedication to getting this job done right. I've certainly enjoyed working with you on this and your many insights as far as what needs to be done on the call centers and so many other issues that you brought to the attention of this commission. It's been several years now that I've been uh, having grave concerns about the federal government's management of the DTV transition. One of my earliest speeches nearly three years ago to the Consumer Electronics uh, Association, uh, I called for a unified federal message and a coordinated national approach. And with the signing of the DTV Delay Act by President Obama, that unprecedented cooperation is finally underway and we can finally move in that direction. I supported the extension of time because it was clear that DTV simply wasn't ready for prime time. Over 3 million coupon requests are outstanding. Our call center is unprepared for the current call level, let alone what we can clearly anticipate. Our field operation needs more time to get in place, and we know that millions of over-the-air households aren't ready 
and weren't about to be ready by February 17th. I certainly thank uh, all the leaders in Congress, Chairman Rockefeller, Chairman Waxman, and the other congressional leaders for giving us, and especially the American people, more time to prepare. But while the law gives us a limited amount of additional time, it also presents real challenges given the long-standing problems that have already existed. Uh, today I'd like to examine some of these challenges. My main focus today is on three categories of concern, uh, the broadcast station transition, consumer experience, and converter box availability. In terms of broadcast stations, while we uh, previously had a hard nationwide DTV transition deadline, now broadcasters have any time between now and June 12th that they can comply with the Commission's uh, rules in the third periodic report. We don't want to see a sort of Wild West scenario where stations are converting virtually every hour, every day in any given market. Uh, and our best advice to consumers would be just to rescan their boxes every day. I mean, certainly we're hoping that uh, there will be a very careful, considered approach as, how, as to how this is done, planning on an individual market basis. And I know that broadcasters are already diligently operating that way. And I, I certainly please that uh, the major networks have indicated they uh, will not transition early. It's unclear, though, uh, what uh, other stations will do yet. We're going to find out, thanks to the public notice that we're putting out today, and we will need your responses promptly to know what your plans are and to try to accommodate the many differing wishes of broadcasters in different communities facing different uh, circumstances. In uh, the past several months, I've visited dozens of TV markets from Charleston, West Virginia, to Seattle, from Honolulu, Hawaii, to Saint Juan, San Juan, Puerto Rico. And I learned from these visits that broadcasters really care deeply about this transition. They're doing the best they can with the resources they have. And I might note it's perhaps the most difficult year financially in the history of American broadcasting that they are undertaking such a difficult uh, transition. I, I hope they'll coordinate in market to make sure that viewers aren't disrupted. I know that they're doing everything they can in that regard. I, know that they've made a big investment in this transition and have uh, been ready to go for some time. But I think that uh, nevertheless, many of them are planning to keep their viewers in mind as they always do and keep their analog signal on. And we very much appreciate those who are willing to do that and understand that others uh, are not in a position to do so and we'll work with them to ensure that that is done in an orderly fashion. The public notice we released earlier today is a good faith effort to balance the needs of consumers and the interests of broadcasters pursuant to the letter and spirit of the DTV Delay Act. So let's work together on a smooth path to the finish line. In terms of the consumer experience, uh, thanks to Chairman Copps, uh, my office has been deeply involved in working with Commission staff and grassroots contractors and grantees and consumers to build on our existing outreach efforts. And we'll hear from some of our panelists today. This is one of the areas that will certainly benefit from the extension of time. We know we were far from ready. We appreciate the efforts that have been made, but uh, there is a lot more to be done and not, frankly, a lot of time to do it, given the difficulty of the training and getting something organized akin to a national field operation in short order. Now, we have made great progress towards developing that effort uh, for consumers. Our goal is to ensure that everyone in need of information and support receives a consistent standard quality of service from our integrated call center and local help centers and are directed to local resources for additional technical assistance, which may include on the ground installation or other assistance services. While we continue to believe that the basic level of service in every DMA is critically important, we nevertheless must continue to identify special challenges, prioritize our limited resources to target the at-risk communities and consumers we know of and align stakeholders to form a consistent and coordinated effort. The backbone of our national outreach effort is our Commission's hardworking staff. And for several months, over 200 FCC employees from the headquarters and our field offices have been working long days and nights and weekends, and I've worked with some of them those long hours uh, to ensure that consumers' needs are met in every market <coughs> in the country. They've really been the foot soldiers throughout this transition, whether they've had too little guidance in some cases or whether they were being micromanaged in others. They certainly experienced both. Through it all, they've stayed on course, committed to meeting the needs of the American people. And their general has been Kathy Seidel here. We're looking forward to hearing from you. We appreciate your long, hard efforts on this and your deputies in the Bureau as well as the Media Bureau uh, who have all done such hard work. But needless to say, from the outreach perspective, we're moving from 
general awareness, in-house assistance from uh, lid drops and community-based help centers. Or we're hopeful that we'll soon receive additional resources so we can build on those efforts and take what we've learned and make sure that we have a national coordinated but locally based grassroots effort and a field operation that's responsive to the needs of the many at-risk communities that we serve. We'll hear today also about the converter box availability issue, which is a, a genuine concern of mine, highlighted by some of the testimony we'll hear. Assuming that broadcasters transition in orderly process, as we hope, and consumers are properly assisted on the phone or in the field as we plan to make happen, that everyone who needs a federal coupon actually gets one. Uh, the ultimate question is, will there be enough boxes for everyone who needs one? I remember when I visited San Juan last year, the availability of boxes was a concern because Puerto Rico's over-the-air household population is over 50% uh, over-the-air, and it's the highest in the U.S., and they're an island, so it's tougher to get the boxes out there. And the stores I visited had uh, hundreds of on-site uh, boxes and thousands in regional warehouses, but if you did the numbers in terms of how many boxes there were, despite these large inventories, there inevitably are not enough boxes to meet all of the needs of the people on the island. Today I'm deeply concerned about whether there will be sufficient government eligible boxes on a national level. According to industry reports, it appears there won't be enough converter boxes. If that's the case, what could we do to encourage manufacturers to produce more as soon as possible? And I'm interested in working with and hearing from the Consumer Electronics Association on that point. It's clear to me that all facets of this transition require open discussion and cooperation. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for setting the right tone in terms of getting us back on track under your leadership and with the continued support of all of us on the Commission. Of course, Congress, other federal agencies, private industry, community groups, and consumers, we will make it across the goal line together. Thank you, uh, Jonathan, for your statement. Uh, thank you for your kind remarks. And thank you most of all for the uh, vision and de dedicated effort that you have put in to serving the public interest uh, and the actions that you take, which are invariably motivated by serving the public interest. We're grateful to you. Commissioner McDowell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would also like to congratulate you today for chairing your first uh, open meeting. And it, it's a real pity that uh, we're not working on something more significant today and that uh, our actions today will be largely ignored. But uh, nonetheless, it's a good first start. Uh, I'm really pleased that we have uh, gathered together today representatives from some of the groups involved in helping American TV viewers prepare for the digital TV transition. Today's panels don't represent the full range of people involved in all of the efforts, but we are doing the right thing uh, by beginning to open the doors and the windows into the process so that everyone can be better informed about, about what all of us can do to minimize the inevitable disruption and confusion this transition will bring. Yesterday, Congress gave us over four more months to help prepare America's over-the-air television viewers for the analog cutoff. All interested parties, including those of us in government, the private sector, especially broadcasters, and our friends in the nonprofit realm, must use this gift of time wisely. Now is not the time to second-guess or engage in the Washington blame game. We must close ranks and march swiftly toward our goal together. Although we do not yet have all the answers to the issues raised by the new legislation, today's discussion will allow us to spot new challenges and take the next step to grapple with them. But we still have a long way to go. Along the way, we need to remind the American people that regardless of when stations cut off their analog signals in a particular market, many people will be left behind. Our mission is to ensure that number is as small as possible. I want to thank the Commission's fine professionals and all of our partners for working long nights and weekends on this noble endeavor. Many more long nights and weekends now lie ahead, but I know that you all are all up to the challenge. Before we discuss where we are, let me provide some context regarding our journey thus far. Since last summer, I have been traveling across our great country from Alaska to Massachusetts to warn our fellow Americans of the need to prepare for all digital broadcasting. I started this process with cautious optimism, but by autumn, I had become concerned. 
Although public awareness has been high that something was going to happen on February 17th, by September it became apparent to me that many people still were not exactly sure what it was they needed to do. At the same time, broadcasters in many markets have been left to fend for themselves to figure out the best way to get their over-the-air viewers prepared. Interestingly, some small markets appeared better prepared than some large markets. Many broadcasters took matters into their own hands early on by initiating soft tests, setting up market-wide call-in numbers to answer viewers' questions, and working with local civic organizations to get coupons and converter boxes into the hands of the needy. Yet other markets took less initiative and are less well-prepared as a result. Now that the DTV Delay Act is becoming a reality, it is important for everyone to understand that this transition will be messy regardless of when it happens. This is a message I've been relaying for months now. For instance, at the end of January, as was pointed out, Nielsen reported that about 6.5 million U.S. households, or 5.7 percent of the total TV viewing population, are unprepared for the analog cutoff. While the Nielsen study revealed an improvement in readiness by 1.3 million households from its previous monthly report, it also implicitly tells us that not everyone will be ready regardless of when the cutoff date falls. We have no way of knowing where the unprepared are, and we will not know until the analog signals start to shut off. The delay will incrementally help with some challenges but it may also highlight new problems. For instance, will consumers be even more confused about the cutoff date and its meaning? If so, what can be done to clarify the truth for them? In short, what is the best way to help consumers? I also want to uncover any hidden truths. For instance, do enough converter boxes exist to supply all who need them? Will consumers receive satisfactory answers to their questions through call centers operated by the government and industry? How many broadcasters might shut off their analog signals prior to June 12th? How will such actions affect consumers? The list of questions is really almost endless. One particular focus of my concern over the past several months has been our call center effort. To be blunt, until very recently, the FCC call center had been inadequate. As my letter of January 14th to uh, then Chairman Martin made plain, I started to test our system myself last month and ran into repeated busy signals and dropped calls before I ever reached a live operator. And it wasn't until after I released that letter that our call center started operating on weekends, when it seemed to me anyway that many consumers struggling with converter boxes or reception problems would be most likely to call us. I'm encouraged, however, that within the last few weeks we've expanded the FCC's own capacity to handle increasing call volumes and we've started to ensure that live operators are available on weekends. And I note that we have made impressive strides in just a matter of days to integrate the FCC's call center with an even larger call center operation being pulled together by the National Cable and Telecommunications Association and the National Association of Broadcasters, among others. I'm hopeful that the end result of these efforts will make a new national coordinated call center easier for TV viewers to use and will provide individual callers with truly useful help. But we are not in the clear yet. Much work remains to be done. While we focus on viewer needs, however, we must not, must not lose sight of the significant effort that broadcasters across the country have undertaken in reliance on the old February 7th transition date. Broadcasters have not only invested millions of dollars into new DTV facilities and equipment, they also now face the additional burden of continuing to pay electricity costs to power two broadcast facilities, one analog and one digital, all while advertising revenue plummets due to the recession. These unanticipated costs amount to many thousands of dollars per month per broadcaster and could force stations into the unenviable dilemma of choosing between staff layoffs or continued analog operations. Many broadcasters are also locked into equipment or tower contracts, also amounting to many thousands of dollars, that are all based on a February 17 analog cutoff. Accordingly, 
per today's public notice, when reviewing requests for analog terminations on or before February 17th, the Commission must balance individual broadcaster situations against consumers' needs to have access to critical news and information that they may only receive through their TV sets. Nonetheless, despite the obstacles ahead, I'm heartened by uh, the Chairman's leadership on this issue and energized by the fact that our professional and hardworking staff is being given the opportunity to do its best work now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Rob, for an excellent uh, statement and also for your leadership and again for Jonathan's as we uh, chart our way through this uh, morass. Uh, Madam Secretary, would you uh, at this time like to uh, detail our agenda for this afternoon? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Today's agenda consists of three panel presentations by senior agency officials as well as industry, consumer groups, and others involved in the digital television transition. The first panel will feature information on DTV consumer outreach efforts. The second panel will feature information on the Commission's DTV call centers. The third panel will feature information on reception issues and the Commission's analog nightlight proceeding. This is your agenda for today. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Uh, before proceeding with the panels, I would just like to announce that we have a late addition to our third panel. Eloise Gore, Associate Bureau Chief of the FCC's Media Bureau, uh, will make a presentation on the FCC's public notice on termination of analog television service, which we uh, adopted earlier today in response to Congress's uh, enactment of the DTV Delay Act. Uh, before proceeding with panel one, uh, I also want to especially note the fine work of Commissioner Adelstein and Rudy Brioche of his staff who have assumed a lead role in our work on consumer outreach, the subject of our first panel. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, for allowing me to provide a report to you today on the FCC's DTV outreach efforts. As you know, the FCC staff in the field and here at headquarters have been working with NTIA, other governmental entities, and community-based organizations throughout the country, as well as industry, industry stakeholders such as the National Association of Broadcasters, the National Cable and Telecommunications Association, the Consumer Electronics Association, and the Consumer Electronics Retailers Coalition to help prepare consumers for the digital television transition. By early next week, FCC staff will have conducted outreach in each of the 210 Nielsen designated market areas throughout the country, plus Puerto Rico. In these communities, FCC staff has been educating consumers and establishing partnerships with broadcasters, <coughs> local officials, community-based organizations, and others. These collective efforts have resulted in consumer awareness of the transition, increasing from about 64 percent in December of 2007 to 93 percent in September of 2008. I must start by thanking each and every FCC employee who has contributed to this effort. These em employees spend every bureau and office throughout this agency. However, as we all realize, more work remains. Under Chairman Kopp's leadership over the past two weeks, we have been focusing on integrating all of our various outreach efforts. First, we are integrating our own internal FCC outreach efforts with those of the FCC contract award winners and NTIA grantees. The chart you see identifies the 12 entities that were awarded FCC contracts to perform DTV outreach assistance throughout the country. In a moment, you will hear from the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights and the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, who will tell you more about what they are doing with their NTIA grants. We are making sure that FCC field staff are aware of and working with all of these entities who are providing services in their areas and that they are coordinating efforts to maximize hands-on assistance to consumers. Second, we are integrating our internal outreach efforts with the FCC's call center. You will hear later from Andrew Martin about specific actions taken with our call center over the past few weeks to expand and enhance its capabilities. Integrating our enhanced call center with our outreach efforts will allow us to further benefit consumers by quickly providing consumers with the resources they may need to successfully complete the transition. 
We know there are consumers who will need assistance at the local level. Some will need hands-on assistance with instructions on how to connect and operate their converter box or to answer specific questions in person. Others will need in-home assistance to actually install the converter box in their home and provide help with reception issues. We are compiling information that will be accessible to our call center agents as well as our on-the-ground field staff that includes the names, locations, and contact information for every entity that has been identified as providing walk-in help center assistance as well as those that are providing in-home installation assistance for consumers. This way, when our call center agents answer a call from a consumer who needs hands-on help, they will, they will be able to go into the system, type the consumer zip code, and have access to referral information for the consumer. Similarly, the same information will be made available to our field staff, staff conducting outreach so that they too can refer consumers to these organizations and locations where this important hands-on assistance will be made available. In addition to integrating our resources to more effectively and efficiently provide assistance to consumers, we are proactively identifying D DMAs where more staff coverage may be necessary. We are identifying these markets by using data such as numbers and percentages of over-the-air viewers, the latest coupon request and redemption rates, industry surveys, data we are developing regarding DMAs where signal loss is an issue, as well as our first-hand knowledge of the DMAs through our boots on the ground efforts. We will compare these markets with the information we receive on when various stations will be completing their transitions so that we may prioritize and adequately staff each market, particularly around the time when its stations will be shutting down analog transmissions. Additionally, in order to supplement our existing efforts, we are actively engaged in recruiting local governments, libraries, fire departments, faith-based organizations, and other community-based organizations around the country to establish their own DTV transition walk-in help centers and or provide in-home installation assistance to members of their communities who may need that extra help. We also know that with the new legislation that was passed by Congress yesterday, our messaging will have to shift to be more locally targeted, particularly with regard to the date or dates that stations in each market complete their transition. The focus of our messaging has evolved over the past 90 days from it's coming, how you may be impacted, and what you can do to be prepared to it's here, act now, and what you can do to troubleshoot potential problems and now where local help is available. This will continue to be our focus. In addition, because many of the reception issues experienced by consumers can be specific to each station and may depend on variables such as the station's build-out schedule, location of its transmission tower or towers vis-a-vis -vis viewers, any changes in the station signal coverage and variation, variations in terrain, we are working with local stations and broadcasters and encouraging them to develop and disseminate station-specific messaging for their viewers. In conclusion, as we all realize, the DTV transition is approaching at full speed with vulnerable consumers at risk of being left behind if they fail or are unable to act it is all of our jobs to assist in a unified and combined effort we, in consumer, we encourage consumers to act now to either prepare themselves for the transition or assist others in their community who need help we encourage volunteer organizations with a local presence to establish walk-in help centers to assist consumers in applying for coupons learning how to install converter boxes uh, their converter box or troubleshoot problems they may have. Similarly, we encourage trusted sources in the local communities to provide in-home installation assistance to those who need it most. We will be, continue to be engaged in educating consumers and encouraging and developing partnerships with our activities to ensure that all consumers are aware of the transition and more importantly able to do what is necessary in order to be prepared. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kathy. I, I guess I just assumed everybody in this room knows you. I think they probably do, but that was uh, Kathy Seidel, Chief of the Consumer and Governmental Affairs Bureau, who has been doing yeoman's or yo woman's work on uh, the DTV transition, and we thank you for all of that. Uh, next, we will uh, hear from uh, Tony Wilhelm, Consumer Education Director at our uh, sister agency, NTIA. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, for the opportunity to provide an update on the TV Converter Box Coupon Program generally and on our stepped-up outreach efforts specifically. NTIA appreciates the Chairman's leadership in accelerating the government's coordination and commitment 
to making the DTV transition a smooth one for all Americans. NTIA's new Deputy Assistant Secretary, Ana Gomez, has echoed the Chairman's welcoming of Congress's passage of the DTV Delay Act, which will allow millions of Americans the additional time they need to prepare for the digital transition. Ms. Gomez has made the digital transition one of her top duties at NTIA. The next step will be for NTIA to receive the additional funds it needs in order for the agency to quickly eliminate the waiting list and provide coupons swiftly to those who need them. As of yesterday, the waiting list included over 2 million households with requests for over 3.7 million coupons. This funding is included in the stimulus package that passed the House and is pending in the Senate. Once NTIA receives this additional funding, it will be possible to make other program improvements such as sending out coupons via first class mail. NTIA has ramped up its overall coordination and assistance on consumer outreach with the FCC and the White House. The Chairman's team, along with Deputy Assistant Secretary Gomez's team, have sharpened their coordination, meeting on a daily basis to leverage our respective consumer education efforts. Let me give two quick examples. First, you will hear more about this in the second panel, but we are ensuring that the Coupon Call Center provides consumers with an experience that is as seamless as possible. Second, we are assessing our on-the-ground consumer assistance to see where we have gaps. With over 400 partners and with assistance from over 40 federal agencies, NTIA and the FCC will work with them to deepen their efforts in areas of the country that require special assistance. For example, given broadcasters have the ability to transition earlier than June 12th, we will work with our partners in those markets so consumers are not caught off guard. The DTV Delay Act is a welcome relief to those vulnerable consumers who require hands-on assistance to make the switch. They need help applying for coupons, but they also need assistance in picking uh, converter boxes up at retail stores and installing them. Homebound seniors, persons with disabilities, those on fixed incomes, and who mainly speak languages other than English are of particular concern to NTIA. The latest Nielsen numbers show that many of our fellow Americans remain unprepared for the transition and are in need of assistance. To that end, I am pleased that NTIA is partnering with two outstanding organizations who are working to bring the benefits of digital television to the neediest Americans. The National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, N4A, and the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights Education Fund have both been actively engaged on this issue for several years now, and both have rolled up their sleeves at the grassroots level to connect the unconnected and to serve the unserved. Thanks again, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, for your abiding commitment and <coughs> continued leadership in challenging all of us to get this digital transition right. The American people deserve nothing less. Thank you, Tony. I had the uh, opportunity yesterday to speak uh, briefly with incoming Deputy Assistant Secretary Gomez, and I'm uh, looking forward to uh, working with you and her. You'll have a splendid team over there, and we, uh, we look forward to that. Uh, next, we will hear from our friend uh, Mark Lloyd, who is Vice President for Strategic Initiatives at the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights and the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights Education Fund. Uh, uh, an old friend who's been involved in uh, many good causes, and uh, this is one of the especially good ones we're glad you're involved in. Chairman, Chairman Copps, it's uh, uh, very good to be able to say Chairman Copps, and uh, again, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting us here. Mr. Chairman, members of the Federal Communications Commission, uh, again, uh, thank you for pulling together this hearing on the DTV transition. Uh, it's an extraordinarily important issue for our community. The Leadership Conference on Civil Rights and the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights Education Fund work in coalition with over 200 organizations across the nation to advance the goal of equal opportunity and equal justice in America. We are now working nationally with our coalition partners and paying special attention to seven communities as the nation makes this transition from analog to digital television. Before I describe our education work and assistance work, I'd like to thank former FCC Chairman Richard Wiley for introducing me to this issue when I worked briefly with him some 17 years ago. 
I'd also like to thank my fellow founding members of the DTV Transition Steering Committee, especially the National Association of Broadcasters, the National Cable Television Association, and LG Electronics. And I'd like to thank very much the uh, National Telecommunications and Information Administration for supporting our work. The LCC Field Department has been working hard on getting information to the most vulnerable Americans about the DTV Transition Coalition or about the DTV Transition for over a year now. Erica Swanson and Sonal Patel have been managing the work of coordinators, a dozen DTV assistance centers and other local community-based organizations and partners in Atlanta, Detroit, Minneapolis, Portland, Seattle, San Antonio, and the San Francisco Bay Area. We are continuing the work we've been doing, as I said, for over a year now to inform people about the coupon program, how we're providing uh, information about where to get the converter boxes and antenna, how to set that equipment up, and uh, continuing uh, to help people figure out how to keep their existing television sets and provide a resource to people to donate and receive donated coupons. Despite the roller coaster ride of reports about NTIA running out of money, the failure of Congress to act on a delay, the passage of the delay, the news that not all television stations uh, will follow through on the delay, uh, there is an eagerness in all the communities we're working with to work together uh, and to share information with public officials, with public and commercial broadcasters, retailers, and uh, both local and federal government officials. We still get questions about the coupon program. Uh, some of the questions are as basic as still how do people sign up uh, and, uh, and when will the coupons that they've applied for uh, finally arrive. Uh, but as compared to when we started the work, we are getting many more questions now about what are the best uh, and least expensive boxes, where to find them in the communities uh, that people shop in, uh, and how do they set these boxes and antenna up with the, with the television sets and uh, continue to keep the uh, local television stations, and also how do they use the boxes to rescan for, uh, uh, for the local channels. It's also very clear that many Americans at this time that there is really a, a continuing concern that 30 or $70 for many Americans for converter box or antenna is still a big expense. Uh, and folks are struggling trying to figure out how they're going to meet this expense. Uh, we have been able to generate substantial local media coverage and our assistance centers are frankly overwhelmed. Uh, with calls from local media, but also from folks just trying to get more information. Uh, these are local community-based organizations that really are, they don't have a PR office, uh, and folks are trying to continue the work that they're doing, and folks have really been just sort of res uh, overwhelmed the response. Uh, if we have a challenge, it is that we are determined to meet uh, the needs of our target populations, particularly the elderly, the disabled, uh, ethnic and racial minorities, uh, those whose first language is not uh, English. But frankly, we are getting an awful lot of calls and walk-ins from people from the general population looking for support, and, and we are dedicated to supporting those populations as well. We're also hearing from people who have done everything that they were told to do, uh, and they've got an antenna and they've got a converter box and they still can't get the channels that they were used to getting before. Um, most of our assistance centers have been open for about a month now and we've trained literally across the country tens of thousands of people and provided direct assistance to well over a thousand people. Uh, and uh, I asked Erica again before I uh, came here whether I could really make those claims. She says, yes, absolutely, you can say that. Uh, but let me tell you the story of one woman um, and, uh, and then end with a few recommendations. And I'm going to call her Mrs. Dorothy. Mrs. Dorothy has a terminal illness. She lives on a fixed and limited income. Her illness and her income make it next to impossible for her to leave her home. Mrs. Dorothy does not have a computer. Her lifeline is her over-the-air television. She knew the transition was occurring in February. Uh, she was a bit confused about what that meant, but she applied for a, a coupon at the end of December, and then she was put on a waiting list. She was, frankly, uh, extraordinarily upset and did not know what to do. Uh, she, because of her cost of living, 
and her very high medical and pres uh, prescription expenses, she understood that buying a converter box was simply above her means. A direct service provider in Minneapolis who saw her on a regular basis put her in touch with one of our assistance centers and our local coordinator. Uh, and we are conducting a coupon exchange program in the Twin Cities. So the LCCREF local coordinator mailed her one of our donated uh, converter coupon box uh, programs, uh, one of the uh, converter uh, box uh, coupons. Mrs. Dorothy's brother is going to help her redeem the coupon and purchase a converter box and help her set it up. Uh, our local coordinator talked with her and her brother to help them figure all this out. Uh, and, uh, and assured them that they would be able to keep the uh, local television service and Mrs. Dorothy just broke down crying on the phone. She said she was confused and frustrated and frankly scared to local uh, that she was going to lose her, her TV and was thankful that she had some help finally uh, with someone who was going to help her walk through this. Mrs. Dorothy and the thousands like her need help, direct help, to keep their local television service. She is just as much an American as anybody. And we must not trying, we must not stop trying to do all we can to make sure that she remains connected to her community. The recommendations, there really must be a central database of all those in each community across the country working to assist people in the transition. So we are working hard with partners in seven cities to reach out to local broadcasters, the state broadcasting associations, the retailers, the local and federal officials. There are folks on the ground, church groups who really are helping, but there isn't a coordinated database of all those folks on the ground helping in those local communities. And again, we know the local broadcasters, the retailers, and others are willing to help. There must be a central place for those folks to go so they know who's doing what on the ground. There must be an easy-to-use resource that will tell, uh, to tell us what stations are shutting off their analog service and when. And this resource should also tell us when a household is beyond the reach of a strong digital signal. Third, there must be an intelligent, interactive call center in place that is accessible to people in multiple languages and to people who have hearing or visual limitations. And finally, community-based organizations are under tremendous strain given our nation's current economic challenges. This transition to digital must move forward. Uh, but it must not be another unfunded burden for these community-based organizations. We need to make sure that local community groups get the resources that they need to assist our most vulnerable citizens. Again, thank you again for having this hearing and, uh, and allowing us the opportunity to testify. I look forward to, uh, to your questions and uh, to the rest of the agenda today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mark, for your uh, helpful recommendations and for really helping us put a human face on this problem that sometimes we think of just in terms of legislation and everything else. Uh, that's, that's very good. Our uh, final presenter today is uh, Sandy Markwood, who is the CEO of the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, uh, an organization that has really stepped up to the plate and partnered with government, and we are uh, delighted to have you here and eager to hear your insights. Thank you so much, and I'd like to thank all the commissioners for holding this hearing and also for your efforts to ensure that when the transition occurs that no, no American, especially older Americans, are left in the dark. In saying that, on, I'm here on behalf of the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, but the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging is the lead organization for keeping seniors connected, a coalition of nine national aging organizations who have come together and have worked for years with staff from FCC and NTIA to bring the issues of the need for additional support to older Americans during this DTV transition to light. And I really want to appreciate and acknowledge the support of both the staff from FCC and NTIA who have listened to us for the past two years and have given us assistance to help older Americans in this country. 
On behalf of the Keeping Seniors Connected Coalition, which again is comprised of nine national organizations, N4A received funding from NTIA to help older adults, especially the vulnerable older adults in this country, who really rely on analog-only television at this point. When we started the conversations with FCC and NTIA now several years ago, we knew that eight million older adults in this country relied on over-the-air broadcasting. In looking at that, we also knew that the 8 million older adults who relied on, on over-the-air broadcasting had specific challenges. They had challenges of access to be able to find out about what they needed to do to tackle the DTV conversion. We also knew that they really um, were facing access problems as far as accessing coupons. Many of these older adults don't have internet access, and there was great confusion on how to apply for a coupon. And as a result of that, even those that applied for a coupon, many of them had coupons expired because they didn't understand the expiration date. Also, you're talking about older Americans, many of whom who have mobility limitations, for whom even if they have a coupon, they can't get to a retailer to be able to purchase a box. And because of those mobility limitations, they can't connect the box once they get it. So through the Keeping Seniors Connected Coalition, through our cooperative agreement with NTIA, these groups of national organizations are coming together. And we've come together in over 100 communities across the country to be able to help older adults on the ground to be able to get the one-on-one -on -one technical assistance they need to be able to make this conversion successfully. Through these community groups, we are going into the homes of older adults to assess whether they, what is needed to help them make the conversion, what kind of box they need. And in addition to the box, as you all know, it's not just the converter box, it's the antenna and a, a range of other equipment that's necessary to ensure that the box can be successfully attached to the television. In addition to the assessment, we're actually helping people apply for the coupons and are very excited about the coupon program opening up again and then tracking the coupon so that we can find out once someone receives a coupon that we can help them get to the store to actually get the converter box. And then going into the homes and getting the equipment that's necessary to make that conversion work. In addition to the converter box and when we're tackling the issue of technology, I'd also like to point out for older Americans that it's also a struggle to be able to use new remotes and to be able to find their favorite programming with a whole new system. So through this national contract with NTIA, what we're doing is, is having on-the-ground foot soldiers to be able to help older older Americans, especially the most vulnerable, those who are low income, those in rural areas, those who are limited English speaking, those who are homebound and the most frail to be able to successfully make this conversion. I'd echo Mark's comments when we're looking at recommendations for the future is that we need to have a system, especially with the delay, which we, um, which we commend Congress for initiating, to be able to make sure that people get the right information, the correct information from, from trusted resources to know what they need to do next. And in addition to that, to know as broadcast as broadcast systems change over time, that they know what to expect in different communities across the country. And then echoing Mark's comments is that a lot of the work that needs to be done on DTV needs to be done by community groups, by groups who really have great big hearts but very limited and slim wallets. And that we need to be able to support these groups and the volunteers that are on the ground to make sure that they can do this work and do it well. Having the, having the delay, having this extra time is a gift, but it's also a limited gift because still we have limited time to make this work. And so we need to make sure that we support communities, we support nonprofits to be able to do that hands-on work on the ground. With that, again, I'd like to commend you for this hearing. I'd like to commend all of my colleagues because together I believe we can get the job done and we can get it done right. But it's going to take a collective effort of government and communities and volunteers throughout the nation to make sure that it's done well. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really encouraging to know we have uh, people of your dedication and caliber involved in this and we are, we are grateful for that. Uh, what I envision now is that we would take uh, maybe 15 minutes or so, we're 
probably everybody's realized that this is going to run a little bit longer than uh, than we may have thought, but I think that's uh, that's fine. Uh, so we'll start off with uh, ten or so minutes of questioning from up here, and then if I'm going to ask if uh, anybody down there has a burning question that you would like to ask of one another, or uh, an insight, or a suggestion, or a comment that you might like to. Uh, Mike, uh, Commissioner Alstein, would you like to start the ball rolling? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and of course, feel free to discuss anything, uh, any ideas, and have an interaction down there too. I, I'll start with our own, our own bonded staff here. Uh, maybe a unique question in the spirit of Glasnost, which we've experienced around here. I wanted to ask you a question you probably haven't been asked, which is, how can we, as commissioners or other national leaders, help you and the field staff to do a better job of doing what you're doing? What what can we do to help uh, that? we haven't been doing or that we should be doing or that we could be doing or that we are doing? I think really the answer to that would be more of what you're already doing. I think each of you mentioned all the various opportunities you've taken in the last three or four months to actually do DTV town hall events and actually talk about DTV and every opportunity you have to speak to organizations and to speak to consumers. And I think bringing the attention to the issue and having your presence in and around the country in and of itself has momentum brings press coverage and helps consumers understand that something's happening out there that they actually may need to do something with. And the more that kind of discussion involves demonstrations, converter box demonstrations, and kind of hands-on sorts of activities, I think that also adds to the benefit. Well, that's a good suggestion. I'll, uh, I'm taking you up on it on Monday. I'm heading to Los Angeles, and we're going to meet with uh, community groups. We're going to meet with the entire city council on Tuesday. And uh, I think they are very helpful, and it's certainly great to have the support of our field staff when we go out there. For example, a great person, Roger Goldblatt's helped. Uh, he needs some, some work on his driving skills, but his <laughs> outreach is unparalleled. <laughs> uh, a couple of questions for NTIA. Uh, one of the questions I have as we look at this backlog that's growing, we're very hopeful that Congress will provide uh, the solution so that we can get the coupons flowing again. But my question for you is how long will that take, assuming that at the end of February or mid-February, whenever it is, if we have right now 2 million backlog uh, for four, almost 4 million coupons, how long does it take for us uh, to catch up? I mean, how many of these coupons will we be able to get out on a daily or weekly basis, and how long do you anticipate it will take to catch up uh, and get the coupons out that are on the wait list? That's a great question. We can do about uh, in the range of a one and a half to two million coupons per week. So at this rate, it would be several weeks to liquidate the current uh, waiting list. As you intimate, though, uh, uh, at the time the funds are actually made available, this list could be much larger and therefore would require a longer period of time to liquidate the list. But currently, we're looking at about uh, three weeks. Three weeks, assuming you got immediate relief and then exactly. that grows by the, by exactly. the day. Okay, do, do you uh, at NTI anticipate a, a shortage of converter boxes? We're going to be talking about that later, but I'm curious, and based on your estimates, if you think the inventories are sufficient to meet the demand nationwide uh, throughout the remaining transition period. Yeah, as you say, I mean, the retailers have the precise numbers in terms of uh, supply. What I can say, though, is that the, the retailers have been a great partner since the inception of this program. We've seen many twists and turns as the program has evolved, and uh, Frankly, they've been responsive at every turn. Uh, uh, and based on that past performance, we would expect uh, them to continue to meet consumer uh, demand as the program unfolds. Uh, and to that end, we've had a great partnership with them. We've uh, provided weekly uh, data on our website in terms of requested redemption data so the retailers see uh, precisely where the demand is uh, so we can make the adjustments needed to ensure consumers get the boxes. Well, uh, Mark and Sandy, I certainly applaud your work, and I applaud NTIA for, <clears throat> for funding the great work that you've done and the pioneering work that you've done that's been so successful uh, in the short period that you've had to do it. I'd be curious from both of you um, and <clears throat> in discussion with one another what the main lessons you've learned have been from your experience in the field uh, in reaching at-risk communities, and, and what would it take to create uh, both the best practices from lessons you've learned uh, in all of the the, the ways you would reach out to communities to replicate that nationwide to ensure that every community in the United States, because you've been focused on certain communities, are served in the best way possible. I mean, is it is it what you need is organization? Is it is it leadership uh, from the national government in conjunction with all of you, or is it resources, or or how exactly can we replicate this nationwide? 
Well, through our cooperative agreement with, with NTIA, what we've been able to do is to give small seed grants to communities to help them go that ex extra step and to mobilize staff or volunteers and reimbursing volunteers for mileage. We have examples of staff driving 45 miles to be able to um, to put in converter boxes. I think what needs to happen is, is from our perspective, is is to be able to to support through resources, and it doesn't have to be significant resources to be able to help people mobilize at the local level to be able to coordinate um, efforts to make sure that you can determine who needs help and then to be able to mobilize, whether it be volunteers or, or paid staff, to go out and meet that need. The other thing that we're doing through our project, and I'm sure, Mark, you're doing through yours too, and we are coordinating um, because we have some overlap in some of the cities, but we're trying to, again, target the older adult population in there, is to be able to do training sessions, webinars, and different types of communication mechanisms with our systems nationwide, with all aging organizations to be able to let them hear what we're doing on the ground in communities and the educational efforts and the troubleshooting efforts that we surface to be able to share them nationally. Well, and we've been, uh, aside from uh, sort of uh, cloning our excellent <laughs> staff folks, uh, I would just say uh, we've really gotten a great deal of guidance and support, frankly, from NTIA about how to make sure that we are clear about what we're asking folks to do on the ground, that we are actually recording what we're doing, that we're actually able to uh, help community-based organizations to be accountable uh, from week to week about what it is that they're accomplishing and being able to record what they're doing. Uh, this has really been one of, the, one of the greatest challenges of getting folks to sort of actually stop and record the number of calls they're taking on a regular basis on these sets of issues. Uh, but we'd be more than happy to share the, you know, our work plan uh, with the Commission uh, and uh, to sort of show you what we think it would take to really expand that. Uh, we uh, based a lot of the work that we were doing, NTIA was very helpful for saying these are the target 40 communities, and we looked at those 40 communities and determined really where we had the most amount of strength and contacts on the ground and sort of trying to figure out how we were going to move forward uh, based on that. Uh, and, uh, and we really do think that the work uh, in those other 33 or so communities really needs to be, be done, and n 4 has really sort of stepped up to take some of that work. But community-based organizations need the funds. Uh, they need the clarity about both the messages, how to make sure they're accountable, how they're counting all the folks that they're serving on a regular basis. Uh, and, uh, and the other important thing is just the coordination just being able to be in touch with the retailers, with the public and commercial broadcasters on a regular basis, uh, along with the government officials, uh, and figuring out who's doing what work, what work on the ground has also been just extraordinarily important for us. There are a lot of people out there who really do think television is, is important. <laughs> the Internet hasn't taken over everything yet, and so folks are sort of willing to sort of stop in and help. Uh, but giving them some clear guidance about how they can help making sure that we don't have people going into people's homes who uh, really are not prepared to do that and really shouldn't be doing that. Uh, so we're more than happy to sort of work with you on how to push the plan out. Well, we would look forward to sitting down with, with you and, and you, Sandy, and, and all the other community groups that are involved and in coming up with a, a plan, trying to come up with best practices, and hopefully we will be able to get the resources to replicate that everywhere. I mean, one thought when you talked about the, uh, the resources needed on a micro level is that we do have the ability, if we get resources, to give out small grants under $3,000 without going through the regular federal procurement process. Should we get the resources uh, from Congress that we could distribute, that might be very helpful. I mean, it sounds like a small amount, but seeding in small organizations can be crucial, especially if we have the right plan, having developed it with, with all of you, to uh, try to replicate that across the country because every community in the United States needs this. Every time I landed on the ground, I was sensed how ad hoc our effort was. I mean, get to a community, we'd do these things, we'd make a real difference, but I was worried about the places we weren't. And I'm worried about the places that you aren't. Uh, we need to have that kind of effort everywhere. Uh, you now, Mark, you commented on, on uh, areas that consumers won't be able to get the digital signal, all these different, different holes. And I'm wondering who you think can best educate consumers about that, or who all of you think 
is best situated to uh, get that word out to people because we're going to get all these phone calls from people that lost Channel 4 or Channel 7, and that's going to overwhelm our call center. I think the more we can get that information out up front, the better. Now, are the broadcasters the one? We can talk to them about it on a later panel to get that out. So they need to start advertising this uh, extensively? Do community groups do that? Uh, you look on our website and look at these maps, and believe me, nobody can make heads or tail of them except for engineers, right. and even then it's tough. Right. But right. that has to be translated in a language people can understand. And who best to translate it? Who do you think is best to communicate that? Well, I, I know that my, uh, my friends at the National Association of Broadcasters won't particularly appreciate this, but uh, what, what I've been telling folks to do is to call their local broadcasters. Uh, and if they're broadcasters that they really, like my, my mom, is, she's, she relies on like, one particular local broadcasting channel for news and information. And for folks who really have developed that close relationship with a local broadcaster, Call that local broadcaster and, and let them know where you are and uh, tell them you want to make sure you've got the signal and, uh, uh, and, and hopefully they'll have the information uh, uh, to provide you to let you know whether you're going to be able to continue to, to get that signal or not. Um, but I know the local broadcasters are also struggling with this, uh, particularly in uh, smaller markets and in rural areas. Um, so uh, the degree to which we can help you work on, you know, that uh, centralized uh, uh, mapping system uh, that will help the local broadcasters and others get that information out, I would love to be able to help you, help you do that work. But no, we've been, we've been saying call your local TV stations. Yeah. Do you have thoughts on I mean, I certainly think we've got to get the word out in advance. You can't hide the ball. This, if the signal is right. going to go off, we might as well try to warn people about it to the extent we know it so that they uh, go in prepared and don't just come at us on on June 13th mm -hmm. and very upset. Well, thank you for all your work. Thank you. Yeah. Of all the uh, communications problems we, we face, I think, uh, and, and now obviously the education on the change of, of date, but this one is so important. Uh, I can't think of one, maybe one of all the dozens of town meetings I have where somebody didn't get up and say, hey, I just did everything you are talking about here. I've got my box and the antenna and I've called the station as a full signal and I'm still not getting anything. What are you going to do about that, Mr. Commissioner? So we really have to, uh, and, and it's not a comfortable message for, to put out and it's not an easy message for broadcasters to put out, but it's an essential message that we have to combine all our efforts to do. Uh, Commissioner McDowell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be mindful of the time as well because we have two other panels. Uh, but uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you all, all four of you, for excellent uh, presentations, and, and I learned something. This is always that's always good. And thank you, Ms. Markwood. You, I think you did an excellent job of drilling down into the complexities uh, that it really is case by case. Uh, each not only is each uh, market area unique, but each person <laughs> within that market area has unique challenges as well. Um, and I've been saying for a couple months now, at the, you know, at the end of the day, at some point, it becomes neighbor to neighbor, you know, relative to relative, friend to friend, maybe even stranger to stranger, if, uh, if strangers can be friendly here and, and help uh, each other out. Um, but uh, I think you did an excellent job of, of, uh, uh, of showing that up. And also, uh, it's, it <laughs> confirms what I've also been hearing in the field, and I know my, uh, my fellow commissioners have as well. Um, I'd like for each of the four of you to, to maybe give me some insight as to your thoughts uh, as to now that the date has changed, what are we not thinking about? What do we, tell me what we don't know. Uh, what is going to be an unanticipated, unintended consequence of the date change? Um, as I tried to say in my opening remarks, it will definitely help, but it's also going to create maybe some new problems or just uh, bring out some dormant, blatant problems that were there to begin with, and maybe we can just go in the order that you had your presentations in. Help me out. I think, I, I think the first thing um, is that with the um, increased awareness that there has been uh, a shift in the deadline to June 12th, there will be consumers, I think, who just hear that piece of the message and think that they do not need to act until June 12th. And I think the whole purpose of this additional time is to make sure that we have the time to actually do this, you know, in a way that makes sense for consumers. But clearly, we don't want every consumer waiting until June 12th, particularly if some of their stations or even one of their stations or their favorite station, as Mark was saying, goes before 
before then, they need to take the action now. So I think part of the challenge will be making sure that our messaging is clear that the new deadline is the 12th, but that as was discussed previously, some stations may go before, and it's in a consumer's interest to act now, to prepare now, to get the converter box now if they need one. And there's, a, there's really no downside to acting now, but there would be a downside if they're one of their stations that they, they watch changes and they haven't prepared. I guess that's what I would say. Commissioner McDowell, I think you're very wise to think about you know, some of the unintended consequences of this date change. And you know, two, two of the challenges for us is that even though we have the, the uh, delay in the transition, uh, some of the uh, changes we want to make in the program would not kick in until the, the funds were made available through the stimulus. So I think for consumers, you know, there's the issue of uh, continuing to, to be on a waiting list, which causes, I think, a lot of anxiety. Will I ever get this coupon, and uh, do I need to look at other options? Uh, so that's number one. Number two, the uh, law uh, suggests uh, that consumers could come in to have their coupons reissued, which has been a big, uh, I think, consumer issue since day one, uh, you know, now allowing consumers uh, potentially to come in to have their coupons reissued means that we would need to be looking at not only a consumer education strategy that focuses on the remaining uh, unprepared households, but also those who uh, uh, of no fault of their own, have not uh, did not avail themselves uh, in the in the 90-day period they had to get coupons, and are now uh, they they don't know that they are potentially now eligible again to come back in. So it makes our job, I think, tougher in terms of the different elements of the consumer education campaign. Just to be real clear, then the reissue would not uh, we would need to obviously uh, receive the funds. And then we need to do a rulemaking to uh, get that into effect. So we're talking about a period of time there in which consumers would be sort of, uh, again, there would be a, a, a lack of clarity uh, in terms of what the situation is. Let, let me just follow up. I'm not, I apologize for interrupting but on, on that. So we don't know when the stimulus package might uh, pass Correct. and what it will look like, uh, obviously, uh, when it does pass. So can you give me a sense of a timeline, as some have suggested, early to mid-March before the stimulus package because of the President's Day recess and, and all the rest. So, you know, at the earliest, mid-March mid maybe. Um, so what's the timeline after that? That's only 60 days or the less the, before. The timeline is, uh, again, as you su suggest, uh, soon after the stimulus were to pass, we would be able to uh, liquidate the, the uh, waiting list, uh, which is the, the good news. We'd, meet, we'd be able to do that, uh, again, at the rate of about 1.5 to 2 million coupons per week. The uh, reissue would not go into effect until we had completed a rulemaking, which clearly we do in the most expeditious manner possible. But we could be talking about a, another period of time in which uh, consumers would not be able to come in to have their uh, coupons that have expired reissued. Uh, so there are really two elements. One, getting the funds to uh, liquidate the waiting list. Number two, a slightly longer period of time in which we're able to honor reissues, if that's the direction the uh, uh, leadership would want, it, want us to go in. So let's assume for a minute that uh, you had the money you needed and the, the rulemakings established. How quickly physically can coupons be manufactured, either issued for the first time or reissued in the case of expired coupons? How, right. how quickly can the coupon factory, wherever it is, spit those things out? Yeah, we have a quick, we have a quick turnaround. It's around uh, two to three weeks to process, and we're trying to make, a, again, even uh, uh, more process improvements to, to cut down on that time. Uh, so we're in, in discussions to try to shave time off of that period. But we're talking about two to three weeks to process a coupon. The anecdotally from the field, the time frame I was hearing was 21 days that folks from the time they applied to the time they got it at best case scenario. Yeah. Of course, in Alaska and Hawaii, it's a full month, if not five weeks, right, right. Uh, to get them. So. But for you to get the application before it's actually spit out the door, uh, before it hits the mail, and I'll leave aside the third class yeah. mail versus first class right. mail issue, um, how long is that? So, so from the, 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 so the, the time, time that you get the application the time to the time it goes applies, out the door? Uh, it's uh, two to three business weeks plus the time of mailing, which uh, we so would. So, two to three business weeks just to get it out the factory exactly. door. That's right. Before That's it hits right. the mail. Plus the mail. So, you're, you're about, you are correct in your. 21 days or so is not is about an average period of time. So, uh, just thinking out loud here, then, if it's early to mid-March before the stimulus bill passes, uh, you have to 
there's always some time involved before the money's actually freed up. You've got to Correct. do your rulemaking, so it might be late March or even early April Correct. before you can even get to that point. Uh, someone, uh, you have the waiting list to process, right? which at this rate will be how many by early April? Well, it depends Everyone on, in the country. It depends yeah. on demand. Again, uh, right now well, we're at, rate, as yeah. I mentioned, uh, you know, 3.7 million coupons on the waiting list. Uh, our latest figures were uh, about 120,000 new orders per week. So you need to multiply those numbers in terms of uh, where we'd be in mid-March, uh, assuming they stay constant. Uh, right, and only 50,000. Well, right now I thought it was 300,000 a day added on to the list and only 50,000 a day coming off. Mm, uh, is that not right? At one point, I thought that. Right I, now, yeah. we're at about 100, and uh, as I mentioned, 100. The numbers fluctuate quite a bit. The numbers have actually yeah. gone down because I think consumers are, you know, gave up, confused exactly. Yeah. Uh, so we're about 120,000 orders last week. Uh, and uh, in terms of what we're put, just to give you an example, yesterday, for example, we had 142,000 coupons that were added. 91,000 came off. So we basically added 50,000 coupons to the waiting list. Okay. So I guess the point I'm getting at, let's pull out of the weeds here for a second, is um, early April, before we have a hope of sort of opening the factory doors at the coupon factory, right? Yeah. And there's a limited amount of bandwidth, if you, I can use that word, uh, at the coupon factory, all right? All funding aside. Yeah. Uh, and you've got a backlog. The, the first and the, the people who've filed first, you know, applied first, get out first, hopefully. Um, with maybe 60 days to go before the next deadline, the next analog cutoff. Uh, so if we start doing the math, I guess one of the things I just want people to understand, there will still be people who don't have their coupons on June the 12th, uh, regardless of how much money is injected into this just because of the, the physics of government and of your coupon factory. Uh, and uh, so I, I think it might behoove everyone to understand, you know, keep expectations realistic that there will still be people left behind in that regard. Uh, and we can debate some other days whether or not the coupon program should have been means tested or for only over the air, only households. And you know, that was Congress's job. But um, I, I think there, we're talking millions and millions of people, best case scenario, who will still be left behind. So anyway, now that I've completely uh, <laughs> derailed, back to the original question is, what, tell me what I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure there's anything that, that, that uh, that's not clear. I mean, I, I, in addition to the recommendations that, that I suggested earlier, I, there's a recommendation that's really not for this body, uh, but it's for Congress, and that is to waive the Anti-Deficiency Act with regard to the coupon program as soon as possible. I mean, that would allow at least some more flexibility for NTIA to release the coupons. Um, Tony, is that, is that right? Is it no, that's the, really, that's like really getting into the weeds now. Yeah. I, th I think we're looking now at the stimulus as the, uh, as the, only? As the mechanism for uh, injecting new life into the program. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, and the Anti-Deficiency Act at this point would help. I believe it's too late to, yeah. to deal with it. <laughs> that's yeah. too bad. Yeah. Uh, the, I mean, the other the other concern is that the the news reports, and I was on two radio programs this morning. Uh, folks are saying, "Oh, you don't have to worry about anything anymore because you know we've got this delay till June." Uh, when, as we know, that in market by market, there are stations that uh, will be shutting off their analog signal, and they'll be making this transition. So, the degree to which you know we can all be clear that uh, a delay is not required, uh, it's permitted, uh, it would, would continue to be useful. Yeah. Yeah. Just adding, I, I think that your comments earlier is that the, the, the extra time is a gift, but it comes with its complications. And I think we need to be very, very clear on the messaging regarding the time frame so that people don't feel like they need to just wait to June 12th. And in addition to that, I think your uh, the doing the math on the coupons um, really indicates what we've known in the field is that even after the 12th, even with this delay, there is going to be the need for a great deal of tr troubleshooting for people who are left behind. And we need to build that into our response systems to make sure that there is the support for those people who on the 13th uh, end up with a dark TV. Mr. Chairman, just indulge me one more, uh, one more question, um, which is, 
uh, for Chief Seidel. Um, do we have, or do, in combination with industry, with the broadcasters, do we have a point person who has ownership over each designated market area? And the, the, what, when I've been out in the field, yes, there are FCC staff very loyally and, 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 and doing a wonderful job of being out there, but not necessarily someone who could take a whip in the chair and get the broadcasters in a room and say, here's what we think you need to do in this market, or you tell me what, you, what we can do to help you. Um, so there wasn't a sense of real ownership, and I didn't get a, a sense from the private sector that there was real ownership of each DMA. And is that something, A, tell me more about that, and B, if my hunch is correct, what can we do to resolve that? I think, <clears throat> my, I think you're exactly right that certainly the FCC has identified a person in each DMA who is the point person for overseeing all the DTV outreach in that market. And I think what you said is also true in that depending upon which market you're in, I think the, the, the coordination and the relationship within the partnership with the local broadcaster varies. And I think in most cases it's a pretty good partnership. But your, your point about, well, does that person necessarily have a whip and, and um, does that person necessarily have the ability to really direct efforts, I think, that's, that's a, I, I think that is an open question. Um, and certainly, I think it is something that going forward, more and more and closer and closer coordination uh, will be necessary to make this, especially with the different transitioning dates. If I could just emphasize that there are only 210 DMAs in the country. On the one hand, that sounds like a lot. On the other hand, it's not a lot. Between the FCC and NTIA and National Association of Broadcasters and their state associations, we ought to be able to come up with a system where there's actual ownership. There's someone who's held accountable for making sure each DMA has all the information it needs, all the support it needs, and is ready ready to go. Uh, and as I said in my opening remarks, it, there was no correlation between the size uh, or location of a particular DMA as to whether or not they were ready. Some of the smallest ones really had their act together. Some of the largest ones had a ways to go, um, and, and vice versa at the same time. So uh, the point I want to get across is it seems like it was a little Everyone's sort of left to their own devices, and best of luck to you, you know. I, th I think you're right, and I think the additional time that we will have, at least with, with many markets, will enable us, I think, to tighten that up and to make that better. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, an excellent dialogue. Uh, you know, I think it was Tip O'Neill who remarked that all politics is local, and uh, to me, the more I learn about the DTV transition, the more it comes down to, in the final analysis, it's dependent on that uh, community and all. Uh, but that doesn't absolve us at the, any other level of any responsibility because you're doing all these good things with your organization and Sandy's organization, but it's limited. So the challenge is how to get that out, how to get a template out, how to get somebody on the ground in those other areas to uh, take responsibility. Uh, in the interest of time, I just have one brief question that I wanted to uh, uh, ask uh, uh, Ms. Markwood because she mentioned the importance of uh, outreach and assistance to our, to our senior citizens, and uh, it, it's so clear that we need to do that, uh, that sometimes they don't have the technology uh, ability to, to hook up, but even if they do, sometimes they have that 400-pound Magnavox 27-inch television sitting over in the corner that's a member of the family, but it's also a huge piece of furniture that they couldn't move if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. uh, but the question is, you know, I understand the ideal situation is where they ask for help and somebody then is dispatched to go and provide that help, assuming we can, can develop those resources. But it's a vulnerable population and you can't just send anybody out and knock on the door and say, hey, Whoopi, I'm here to hook up your, your television set. Uh, so how, how, big a problem, uh, how big a problem is that and how do we get to those who may not be requesting help but are nevertheless in need of, uh, of help? Well, through the coalition's efforts, and, and members of the coalitions include the Meals on Wheels of America, the National Association of Nutrition Service Providers, folks that are going into the homes of older adults, and with volunteers who have been vetted and had background checks. And what we're doing is building on the capacity of those volunteers and, and looking at adding additional volunteers, all of whom have been vetted and trained to be able to go into the home of an older adult to be able to do those in-home assessments and to actually install the converter boxes. Like you, we don't want 
folks that haven't been vetted, that don't understand um, what it means to deal with somebody who's frail, who has dementia, mm -hmm. who are going into the homes of these individuals to be able to um, have access to these mm -hmm. vulnerable older adults. So we are really doing our best to make sure that whoever goes into the home, whether it, to do, it be to do the assessment or to do the converter box installation, is well vetted and, and knows and and the age and the, and they are approved by the agencies for whom they um, they're working. So it's not just any older adult. Um, we don't have volunteers who haven't been vetted, who haven't had the background checks going into the homes. Are there liability uh, issues involved in this, and uh, that's how you get around them by going through uh, through an agency or? There are liability issues that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis with all of our aging services programs, and so we're looking at this, um, these efforts as part of the bigger liability issues that all of our organizations face. But again, I think when we recognize the fact that when you're dealing with a vulnerable population, in our case older adults or if it would be a young child, that you really need to ensure that you have people going into the homes and working with these individuals who um, have the highest of ethics and that they are tracked and that we know who is in whose home doing mm -hmm. what. So mm -hmm. that is all <coughs> vetted through this process. Good. Before we uh, excuse this panel, does anybody have a burning question or comment or a suggestion they wanted to make to something that they heard up there uh, today? I think we've had a good spirited dialogue, but uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you well, thank you. Much. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Secretary, would you announce the uh, next panel on the agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the second panel presentation will focus on DTV call centers. The panel will feature Andrew Martin, Chief Information Officer of the Federal Communications Commission, Sam Howe, Executive mm -hmm. Vice President of Time Warner Cable, David Rear, President and CEO of the National Association of Broadcasters, and Dennis Lyle, President of the National Alliance of State Broadcasters Associations. Thank you very much. And before we, uh, while they're taking their seats, I wanted to uh, uh, say a special thanks to uh, two individuals who have worked uh, enormously hard. Many individuals have worked enormously hard, but uh, two who have not been uh, mentioned today. One is our uh, Acting Chief of Staff, uh, Rick Chesson, over here, is devoting much of his time uh, to this transition and who has, everybody in this room knows, has a long history in uh, uh, things having to do with digital television. And uh, Gary Epstein, who we've been uh, lucky enough to uh, coax out of retirement to uh, uh, give us a helping hand and bring his wealth of experience and common sense approach to getting folks organized and really getting to the nub of a problem. And I'm delighted that both of them are, uh, uh, are involved in that. So. Uh, uh, with that, uh, I think we're going to start with Mr. Martin. Surprise. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, thank you for inviting me to speak today. Call center activities have served a critical role in supplementing the FCC's efforts to address consumer inquiries related to DTV. As the deadline for transition approaches, these services and information provided by call center agents and advisors will often be the first and potentially only assistance that consumers may be able to obtain to address their concerns. As such, the importance of ensuring that all consumers can both reach and receive effective support through our call center agents and advisors is paramount. The FCC's past and current efforts in evolving its call center functions can be separated into three distinct, albeit overlapping, phases. During the first phase, the Commission invested more than $1.2 million to expand and improve its in-house call center capabilities. During this period, additional agents were hired, Call center hours were extended and infrastructure upgrades were implemented to address a rapid rise in DTV related call volume. Specifically, the Commission has increased its call capacity tenfold, resulting in the ability to handle 10, 1,000 concurrent calls. Agent staffing has increased over threefold from approximately 50 to 200 staff. In addition, we completely re engineered our national call center's telecommunications architecture. The Commission's 15 year old call center infrastructure was placed in its entirety with more robust and modern voice over internet protocol system. These changes were necessary to address daily call volumes that have, at times, exceeded 30,000 calls. In the past, this level of calls was more typical of monthly volume at our facilities. We continue to monitor and refine this implementation. For the second phase of our call center work, we sought to establish a more robust outsourced solution capable of addressing the anticipated surge in call volume around February 17th. 
Early on, efforts in support of this initiative focused on identifying the FCC's requirements. Currently, our efforts are concentrated on overseeing the FCC's recent contract award to IBM. Through this effort, the Commission has contracted for 2 million agent entered calls for the period of February 12th to the 21st. This means the FCC will be able to handle several hundred thousand calls a day. We are providing IBM the materials and guidance needed so that they can rapidly finalize their telecommunications architecture and recruit and train agents. Despite the extensive effort put forth in each of these first two phases, it became apparent that the FCC alone would be unable to muster enough resources to sufficiently and completely address the 3.5 million calls anticipated around the original transition date. The FCC recently entered a third phase. This most recent phase is defined by an unprecedented partnership across the industry, the NTIA, and the FCC. We're coordinating DTV-related efforts in order to take advantage of the increased capability of a larger combined initiative. To date, this group has successfully accomplished several distinct objectives. First, all partners have, to, have agreed to use a single nationwide contact number, 188-CALL-FCC. Second, the activity supporting this number will be hosted through a common, integrated technical approach. This approach has been designed, developed, and is being built for an anticipated live date of February 12th. Third, all agents and advisors will be working from the same set of DTV information as they respond to consumer inquiries. The partners have largely completed development of a common set of DTV information and have begun training agents. To complement this library of information, we have been working with our partners to establish a set of tools that both agents and the public can access for information on local assistance, resources, and service options. Finally, together we have developed a common model for projecting anticipated call volume. We are currently revising this model to address the changes found in recent legislation which moves the final DTV transition date and will continue to collaborate on these projections to better scale the coordinated call center function. Because of this partnership, sufficient call center capacity should be available to address the projected call volume anticipated around February 17th and most likely through June 12th. Our work is, however, far from done. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the Herculean efforts of both federal and contract employees at the FCC. The people have made all of our progress possible. I've been fortunate to work with a team that spans many bureaus and offices, a team composed of individuals from all levels of our organization. I have witnessed a level of dedication and personal sacrifice that demonstrates not only commitment to the FCC's mission, but also a selfless commitment to public service. Recently, these efforts have been complemented by our industry partners who have tirelessly worked with us to ensure coordination of our combined efforts, all of which are focused on easing the digital TV transition for consumers. Thank you for this opportunity, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll just proceed on the basis we have the schedule here, uh, and I think we'll now hear from Mr. Howe. Thank you. Um, Chairman, uh, Commissioners, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you today. I'm Sam Howe, an Executive Vice President of Time Warner Cable. We are the second largest cable operator in the U.S., serving more than 14 million customers in 28 states with multi-channel video, broadband internet, and digital phone and other services. As a critical component of these services and context obviously for today, we operate uh, customer care centers uh, currently staffed with 14,000 representatives. I'm here today to describe for you the certain unique aspects of this call center initiative uh, established really to help uh, manage the millions of calls that could come as a result of the transition. I have the privilege of managing a small ad hoc and elite team of customer care executives spanning both cable and broadcasting, uh, all committed to bringing the call center initiative to life. We're engaged in this effort because we've answered the call of uh, President Obama and his administration. Less than two months ago, uh, they challenged us in helping uh, devise a solution that could really address these needs of consumers uh, related to the transition. So we find ourselves involved in a very exemplary uh, public and private partnership. Uh, and thanks to your leaderships, uh, we're in a place now uh, that we can really be successful. And particularly, I want to call out the uh, wonderful collaboration with the FCC uh, at every level to make this happen in the last couple of weeks. Uh, that partnership is working in effect to marry resources uh, from industry uh, with those of government. Uh, when our work culminates in just a week from now, uh, we'll be in place a, a really robust system that we can handle these inquiries on a single phone number, as has been mentioned. They'll receive uh, consumers the information from a single automated unit, uh, response unit, at first when they call, and then they'll be able to be transferred quickly and easily to a live agent who will provide guidance and advice 
on any number of issues that a consumer may face. We call our consumer response operation the DTV Trusted Advisor Hotline. Uh, live agents have been recruited and hired specially for the project by independent call center providers in locations across the country. They are being equipped with the best knowledge base we can provide about the DTV transition, all the issues and answers that a consumer might need. And they're being trained to be neutral, neutral advisors to consumers who are likely to need a wide variety of information and solutions. We're working to ensure that that experience, the customer consumer experience, in calling that hotline is seamless by providing live agents, whether they sit on the industry or government side, uh, all with a common set of training materials, scripting, and of course, as we've said, a common phone number. So you may be wondering why a cable industry representative is in sitting in front of you today to really talk about this uh, and to talk about managing consumer issues for a transition that is often associated with broadcasters. Well, first of all, cable is a primary purveyor of television, as we know, and to a majority of households. And consequently, we've always felt a stronger responsibility to work with our colleagues in broadcasting and uh, consumer electronics to help this transition take place smoothly. We're proud to be a leader with the others at this table uh, in the transition coalition which has been working on consumer awareness. Uh, we've also uh, been working on the community level in the communities we serve and in civic meetings. And then uh, perhaps significantly, uh, cable and cable programming services have provided more than $250 million in commercial airtime for public service announcements uh, since the uh, transition effort really got underway. And so in short, helping Americans navigate this with our partners has been a big priority for the industry. Secondly, um, it needs to be said our experience in interacting with consumers through call centers has uh, allowed us to quickly access um, uh, industry talent and resources like vendors who can quickly respond. So when in very late December, uh, representatives of the transition team approached us about how we might help uh, ease the transition along, we were happy to respond with those knowledge and resources. This project, which is being executed on a remarkably short timeline, is many layers deep and richly complex. Uh, and so I'm very happy to be here today to help uh, provide more answers about the Trusted Advisor Hotline and how it all works with our partners in broadcasting and the FCC. So thank you. Thank you. Well, we're happy you're here today, too, and we thank you for your good work. Uh, next is uh, the National Association of Broadcasters, David Rare. Uh, <clears throat> Chairman Copps, Commissioner Adelstein, and Commissioner McDowell, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be before you today. Of course, I'm David Rare, the President and CEO of the National Association of Broadcasters, representing America's TV broadcasters. Uh, before turning to the topic of this panel, I'd like to comment about the DTV transition. NAB's written testimony details the comprehensive efforts broadcasters have taken to inform viewers of what they need to do to be ready for, the digital, for digital television. But let me give you the short version. NAB and broadcasters have mounted a $1.2 billion plus consumer education effort, the largest in the history of television. The result is 97% awareness of the switch to all digital broadcasting and 82% of over-the-air households haven't taken action. The level of consumer awareness and action demonstrates that broadcasters' efforts have been and are working. We stand ready to assist the administration and this commission to make sure that all critical steps have been taken to inform and prepare the public for June 12th. We commend you, Chairman Copps, and your fellow commissioners for your leadership in this area. Anticipating the June 12th date, NAB has already taken action to inform stations and viewers of what they need to do, including distributing to stations via satellite earlier today a new NAB-produced 30-second spot in English and Spanish promoting June 12th date, informing television stations yesterday, all television stations, of what they need to do to alert viewers to June 12th and what actions should be taken, hosting a webcast for stations tomorrow to discuss June 12th and attendant issues, continuing to strongly encourage all eligible stations to participate in the FCC Analog Nightlight Program, continuing our empirically based consumer education program, urging stations planning to go all digital on February 17th, 
to continue their countdown clock. And we appreciate the Commission's actions today and we'll let our members know who are not going on February 17th to take the clock down. Continuing and expanding our work with our 241 member DTV Transition Coalition and NAB and I would like to personally thank all of our coalition partners including NCTA, LCCR, hundreds of others and especially uh, the Consumer Electronics Association led by the, their ABLE President Gary Shapiro. There are also several important actions the FCC can and should take to ensure a smooth transition. Some have been talked about earlier today. First, have an effective DC, D FCC DTV call center. It must be robust and as prepared as possible to respond to calls, working with our uh, mega operation. Two, have the new DT, the FCC DTV SAR continue to participate actively with the DTV Transition Coalition. Uh, I don't know if Gary calls himself that, but he's got that nickname from us. And we appreciate that uh, Gary Epstein has already attended one of our recent coalition meetings and has been actively engaged. Third, coordinate DTV transition outreach efforts. We appreciate your leadership, Mr. Chairman and Commissioner Adelstein, for getting all the parties together to talk and coordinate. And fourth, maintain FCC flexibility for stations wanting or needing to make the switch to all digital broadcasting before June 12th. Now, turning to the topic of this panel, NAB is committed to a comprehensive plan as a part of a greater coordinated effort that Sam referenced to see that consumer calls are properly directed and answered satisfactorily. To reduce the aggregate number of calls, NAB has produced and will distribute a nightlight video in both English and Spanish that will answer viewer questions about the switch, such as, what happened? How do I hook up a converter box? How do I scan and rescan for channels? How do I properly position an antenna? And we will also include a checklist of what the viewer should do. In January, NAB launched a new national phone service to help provide consumers with DTV information. We use that as part of the soft analog tests that were going on throughout the country. NAB's interactive voice response IVR toll-free number provides viewers with information in English, Spanish, and Mandarin Chinese. The system first identifies the way the viewers receive television signals, cable, satellite, over the air, and then provides information about how to upgrade with a converter box or a new TV set or scan and rescan channels, etc. NAB's call systems have collected valuable data on callers' needs and DMA trends. The system also identifies zip code hotspots for television stations to focus their resources. Moreover, NAB, in working with our uh, coalition partners, has designed and developed two call systems on the Verizon and AT&T networks that will provide redundancy and ample capacity during the periods of likely high demand. NAB has also shared the design of these systems with FCC and our partners. NAB has also been working with a variety of stakeholders, especially the NCTA and the FCC to coordinate a toll-free hotline with live operators to help and handle viewer calls. Uh, I'd like to commend and acknowledge Kyle McSlero and the board of the NCTA for their commitment and assistance, as well as Sam, who's sitting next to me, who's just doing a bang-up job for all of us, and he should be thanked. The live operators will assist those who, ca who call awaiting coupons, seeking general information, needing help with converter boxes, DTV sets, scanning, and looking for cable and satellite information. NAB is also closely coordinating with state broadcast associations and local broadcasters to complement the national hotline. And I would like to publicly thank Dennis Lyle, head of the Illinois Broadcasters Association and current president of the National Alliance of State Broadcasters, NASBA, and the state associations for their important efforts and contributions, which I'm sure you'll hear about next. In markets with state associations and broadcaster hotlines and call centers, NAB, NAB's DTV video will also direct viewers to call those numbers. Television stations across the country are committing to in-station or market-wide local call centers where possible to answer questions from viewers where local reception problems are the issue. For spotty or weak signals or other regional issues, the hotline would direct viewers to local stations and state association hotlines. In the end, we have a comprehensive four-tier system with an instructional nightlight video an automated system, live neutral operators from both industry and the FCC, and local help desks that will answer viewer calls. We believe these planned components will address viewer concerns. 
Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for inviting me to participate in this hearing. We look forward to continuing our outstanding public-private partnership, and we cannot forget why we are all here. The amazing benefits of free digital television viewers are getting and will receive. You've heard me say this before. Crystal clear pictures, phenomenal sound quality, and more channels and services, and it's free. Thank you. I have heard that before, but we're happy to hear it again. <laughs> And we'll keep saying it. Uh, and thank you uh, not only for your presentation and your work, but as a representative of uh, uh, so many of the nation's broadcasters. Everywhere I go, I try to, the first meeting to have is with the, the broadcasters to understand the peculiarities of uh, our particular problems in a specific area. And they have been such a tremendous resource and uh, uh, so willing to uh, get in there and work. And now if we can use these next three months to really even take it to a new level, that would be uh, just what we need. Uh, finally, uh, we are pleased, and you mentioned the work of Dennis Lyle. We're delighted to have uh, Dennis here today as president of the National Alliance of State Broadcasters Associations. Thank you, Chairman Copps and Commissioners Adelstein and McDowell for inviting me to participate uh, in today's open meeting on the subject of digital television transition. Uh, National Alliance of State Broadcasters Association, NASBA as it's called, is made up of associations representing free over-the-air local radio and television broadcasters operating in the 50 states, the District of Columbia, and the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. I also happen to be the president and CEO of the Illinois Broadcasters Association. And the mission of each state association is the same, namely to protect and advance the best interest of the free, over-the-air radio and television broadcast industry on the federal, state, and local levels. Now, how each state association ex executes its mission can be as varied as the differences between the various states in terms of size, geography, demographics, resources, needs, and priorities. It's clear that a one-size-fits-all expectation or measure of performance would be inappropriate. Now that said, I want to take the occasion to stress that the DTV transition has given the state associations not only an important opportunity to help their television stations and the people they serve with the DTV transition, but also another opportunity to partner with the FCC on an important matter. The DTV transition has further galvanized the close working relationship between the state associations, their television stations, and the FCC in a number of respects. One, the state associations working closely with the NAB and the Association for Maximum Service Television, MSTV, have served as point organizations in getting the word out to their television stations about every conceivable aspect of the DTV transition. Long before any national phone bank arrangements, the state associations worked with their television stations to set up various types of call centers or phone banks. Some of them are statewide, others are DMA-based, still others are station-based call centers. All individual television stations have been providing helpful information to viewers about the DTV transition longer than any national statewide or DTV-centric call centers have been in existence. In short, television stations working closely with their state associations have been and continue to be the original boots on the ground for the DTV transition and they deserve high credit. In that regard, I want to take the opportunity to compliment Roy Stewart, Krista Wittanowski, and the Legion of the Commission personnel in the field who are working so well with me and my colleagues at the various state associations. I know that uh, Krista continues to provide you with updated drafts of what I call her uh, call center chart, so I do not need to include one with my testimony today. But, and uh, thank you, Roy and Krista, for your service in this important endeavor. Three, the state associations working closely with their TV stations have for many months been spearheading consumer education drives. Collectively, they, uh, collectively they've uh, contacted literally thousands of governmental and non-governmental statewide, county, and local agencies and organizations, hosted workshops, gone to retirement, home, retirement homes, gone to meetings, appeared on radio, TV, and in the newspapers, trained volunteers, all of the above. The work has been nonstop and, quite frankly, exhausting. In my own state of Illinois, for instance, we are now speaking with the Army National Guard, a, an organization we have a tremendous relationship with, on creating walk-in centers at the National Army Guard, uh, National Guard armories uh, for an opportunity for, if you will, uh, uh, citizens to come in and kick the tires. That will look and see, uh, see how you hook up a converter box. I'm pleased to report that the state associations have also been working closely with and providing facility and other support to the FCC's own boots-on-the-ground personnel. 
And again, they too are doing an outstanding job complementing the ongoing work of local TV stations and the state associations to provide DTV readiness assistance to members of the public and particularly to the at-risk segments of the communities. Five, the state associations have been working closely with the NAB and the NCTA in conjunction with their existing and proposed call center systems. The state associations are helping to facilitate the identification and training of local organizations whose members daring liability issues are prepared to go into the homes of people who need help in connecting their converter boxes and antennas. The state associations and their member stations simply cannot be placed in the position of assuming liability for the conduct of volunteers who may go into people's homes. Now, neither the state associations nor their stations have the resources or expertise to assess the character or, or other personal qualities of potential volunteers who may go into those homes and apartments. However, the state associations will continue to contact agencies and organizations and urge them to render assistance to the constituents they serve in order for a smooth DTV transition. Now, as mentioned above, the needs and challenges of each state vary considerably, as well as the resources available to each state association. In any event, as the NAB, NCTA, FCC call centers have grown even more sophisticated, now able to answer virtually any type of question that have no unique geographic or market focus, stations and their state associations will be able to concentrate more of their time and resources on responding to questions and requests for assistance that have a truly local focus where clearly there are no one-size-fit-all solutions. I'd like to end by saying that I'm confident that the work performed to date, which is continuing by our TV broadcasters, the TV industry, and its representatives by the thousands of government and non-government organizations and volunteers nationwide and by the FCC will ensure that the DTV transition already accomplished in any increasing number of markets will be successfully completed by June 2009. Thank you. Thank you all. I appreciate uh, all of your presentations. I think as I mentioned at the uh, outset, uh, each of my colleagues has stepped up in a special way to uh, give us some leadership in, in various areas. Uh, Commissioner Adelstein, I mentioned, and Rudy and his fine staff on consumer outreach. And I want to uh, especially uh, mention here the fine work of Commissioner McDowell and Rosemary Harold of his staff who have assumed uh, really a leadership role on the call center uh, work. And by common agreement, we're going to uh, ask Rob if he would like to uh, go first on the questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you all very much for coming out here today. And uh, try to keep you for as little time as possible so you can get back to work. Uh, that's important uh, not to do too much of this, but uh, we do need to, to check. Also, it, it's terrific to see uh, broadcasters and cables sitting side by side in a kumbaya moment uh, without punching each other or calling each other names. That's great. Thank you. And to the cable industry, I'd say, I guess constructively, you actually got your quiet period, didn't you? So uh, here it is, by, by act of Congress in a way. Um, I also think it's important to pick up on Mr. Uh, Mr. Rare's um, comments that uh, it's important to look at the positive benefits for just a second of, of digital television um, and that hopefully you know five six months from now um, this is behind us and uh, consumers are talking about uh, the great benefits of DTV and, and why we did this to begin with uh, better picture quality better sound quality more channels all for free over the air plus uh, on the other uh, side of the public interest ledger is uh, a freed up spectrum that we're able to use uh, hopefully one day for public safety um, as well as uh, all those wonderful new technologies uh, that we auctioned off uh, licenses for in the 700 megahertz auction. So let's uh, not, not lose sight of that. I don't want folks uh, reporting on this story to think this is uh, all just doom and gloom and why the heck are we going through this to begin with. It's going to be a, a lot of huge net benefits to all Americans at the end of this. But it is a uh, trying time, uh, a difficult time. and. Uh, uh, it's producing a lot of anxiety right now. So um, I'd like to actually kind of go back before I focus just on call centers. Just a couple of questions on uh, go back to a theme uh, that I started with the other the other panel, which is uh, really for Mr. Rare and Mr. Lyle um, in terms of ownership over each DMA. Again, there are only 210 TV markets in this country. For those watching at home, called designated market areas or DMAs. And, um, and, and I found it, and granted my travels uh, on this started in August, and that's a lot has happened since August, um, but even some recent travel uh, in the past few months, has found that 
it's hard to find who's actually got ownership. If I wanted to call someone and say what's happening in, I'll just make up a market, market 156, I don't even know what market that is. Um, who, who could tell me and who's sort of cracking the whip there? So, Mr. Rare, I'll start with you. I, is there within your organization sort of a, an organizational chart of, of you know, uh, to, as to who actually has ownership over a particular DMA? Uh, no, and with all due respect, I'm not sure that's the uh, optimum solution. Uh, in, this is for the following reason. And it may be, and we're open to talking about it, the way we've organized our effort, which I said at the outset, I think has been pretty successful from a broadcaster perspective in educating America and making sure they're aware of the transition, et cetera, has been running it like a national campaign. Our campaign manager, Jonathan Collegio, is with us in the back. He's done a phenomenal job. We've empowered all of the stations to run commonly themed messages. Uh, we've given them empirical information, and then we've allowed them to all use their entrepreneurial best to get the messages across. And I, I think that's worked for, pretty for well so second. far. Yeah, if now, I could interrupt and actually okay. respectfully disagree with a little bit about that, yeah. that yes, I think there's a high degree of awareness that something's going to happen, as I said in my opening remarks. But I've been yelled at in too many town meetings across this country about exactly what it is folks are supposed to do. So the nuts and bolts. So from the general awareness, something's happening digitally on February 17th, yes. But then you get into confusion with cable operators. They're upgrading their systems to go all digital. And folks are confused about the set-top boxes that a cable company might be uh, needing to sell them for that versus the, uh, the converter box that, that they need for free over the air TV. Um, I was yelled at in early November uh, in a Philadelphia town hall uh, by people very confused with Comcast going all digital in their, in their campaign, which they launched uh, around Halloween, just before I got there, um, uh, about this exact issue. And they, you know, allegations that the government was conspiring with uh, the cable industry uh, to, to make uh, this uh, something where people were required to hook up uh, to cable. So there's a lot of confusion. There's some procrastinators out there, too. That's why stores are open late on Christmas Eve, right? But, uh, but there are a lot of people who are just confused uh, or through no fault of their own, as we found out, you know, I found out repeatedly, just aren't prepared. So, but the answer is, from NAB's perspective, you run a national campaign. But from the State Broadcaster Association perspective... Well, uh, and I have nothing to yell at you about, by the way. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm not yelling at you either. I'm just talking. Give me a day. Give me a day. Uh, well, for the most part, the State Association is the conduit. Um, for the uh, the state broadcasters for the state DMAs and so uh, uh, for a question regarding a DMA